the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. Uh, with that objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled The Space Leadership Preservation Act and the Need for Stability at NASA. I'll recognize myself for an opening statement and then the minority, uh, the ranking minority member, uh, Ms. Eddie Bernice Johnson from Texas. And let me say, just looking out on the audience today, I'm glad to see so much interest in this subject. And uh, we have actually two panels today. We're going to start off with uh, Congressman John Culberson, and then we'll go to a panel of three witnesses after that. Presidential transitions often have provided a challenge to NASA programs that require continuity and budget stability but few have been as rocky as the administration change we experienced seven years ago. Even before he was elected president, then-candidate Barack Obama planned to delay the Constellation program being built to take humans to deep space destinations. One of the Obama administration's first acts, <clears throat> in fact, was to cancel this NASA program outright. These jarring decisions have been accompanied by repeated budget proposals that continue to cut key programs <clears throat> excuse me, designed to take humans to deep space destinations like the Moon and Mars. The most recent proposal released just a few weeks ago would shrink the space launch system in Orion crew vehicle by more than $800 million. Even worse, the entire budget depends on make-believe budget gimmicks. This regrettable approach continues to make a Mars mission all but impossible. It is not the approach of an administration that is serious about maintaining America's leadership in space. The recent report from the National Academies of Science titled, quote, Pathways to Exploration, Rationales and Approaches for a U.S. Program of Human Space Exploration, end quote, stated that the human spaceflight program in the United States had experienced considerable programmatic turbulence with frequent and dramatic changes in program goals and mission plans in response to changes in national policies. The changes had a high cost in program resources and opportunities and imposed what many feared was an intolerable burden on already constrained human exploration budgets. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, an advisory body established by Congress to report to NASA and Congress on safety issues that affect NASA, stated in their recent report in January that NASA faces another challenge that has historically led to disruption and inefficiency and arguably has impact on safety and good systems engineering. This is the challenge of starting over with new programs and directions following administration change. As in prior reports, the ASAP urges constancy of purpose. Failing to stay the course with current programs of record will make it an even longer, costlier, and potentially less safe trip to Mars. These facts are not lost on this committee. The most recent NASA Authorization Act from 2010 contains several provisions that remain the law of the land and continue to guide NASA activities. The Act notes that the commitment to human exploration goals is essential for providing the necessary long-term focus and programmatic consistency and robustness of the United States Civilian Space Program. The Act states that it is in the United States national interest to maintain a government-operated space transportation system for crew and cargo delivery to space. The Act directs that the United States must develop as rapidly as possible replacement vehicles capable of providing both human and cargo launch capability to low Earth orbit and to destinations beyond low Earth orbit. The 2005, 2008, and 2010 NASA Authorization Acts are consistent in their direction to NASA. NASA needs the same certainty from the executive branch that it receives from Congress. Today we are discussing how to provide that stability to NASA once again as we look toward a presidential transition in less than a year. My friend and Texas colleague, Representative John Culberson, has a bill that seeks to do just that. I thank Representative Culberson for his leadership on this issue and I am a co-sponsor of his legislation. We share the goal of providing NASA with long-term consistent support and it is great to have him here today to discuss his bill. One of the first hearings that this committee held during my chairmanship was, in fact, on this very topic. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses 
how we can ensure stability in our space program through the next presidential transition. Dr. Michael Griffin provides a unique perspective as the last NASA Administrator to serve before a presidential transition. Colonel Eileen Collins not only has served as a pilot and commander of space shuttle missions, but also as a member of the NASA Advisory Council during the last transition. And Ms. Christina Chaplin brings the Government Accountability Office's insightful perspective. We look forward to hearing their testimony and learning how we can ensure that NASA remains on the forefront of space exploration through the next presidential transition. Uh, that concludes my opening statement, and the ranking member um, is recognized for hers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming uh, our witnesses for NASA is a cornerstone of our nation's R&D enterprise, a source of inspiration to our young people, and a worldwide symbol of America's technological proudness and dedication to the peaceful exploration of space. We want it to succeed. Today's hearing is entitled, The Space Leadership Preservation Act and a Need for Stability at NASA. While I have concerns about the legislation itself, I wholeheartedly agree with the premise that we want to preserve America's leadership in space and that NASA will need stability if it is to maintain that leadership role. I am heartened that Chairman Culverson has long felt the same way. That said, I regret that the legislation being discussed today, while obviously well-intentioned, unfortunately is not likely to fix the fundamental causes of instability at NASA. Let me give just a few examples of my concern with what the bill does and doesn't do. First, the bill would establish a board of directors apparently modeled after the National Science Foundation's National Science Board. Of course, NSF and NASA are quite different agencies with quite different missions. So the applicability of the NSF model to NASA is unclear, but there are other differences that also need to be noted. As we know, the members of the NSB are all nominated by the president. The board of directors established in this bill, on the other hand, would have a majority of its members named by Congress using a formula that injects partisan politics into a board that ostensibly is supposed to insulate NASA from politics. In addition, the board would be tasked with preparing a budget for NASA in parallel with NASA's own budget preparations process. This seems to be a prescription for wasteful duplication of the best, at its best, with the potential for serious confusion and instability as, as the more likely outcomes. It is unclear to me how this small group of individuals with no agency management responsibilities or accountability is supposed to develop a detailed budget for a $19 billion agency without having to set up with having to set up an unwieldy competing administrative infrastructure of its own. This is an approach that will not lead to a good outcome. Instead, we should let the dedicated men and women at NASA who are tasked with carrying out NASA's challenging programs be the ones who develop this budget request. It should not be done by a group of individuals who, though may be talented, will not have any accountability for delivering benefits from having an administrator chosen by the president or she, that he or she serves. Having a carryover administrator from a previous president's term would do nothing to ensure stability if the president wishes to pursue a different policy agenda from his or her predecessor and doesn't see the administrator as being part of his or her team. In addition, as history shows, having a fixed term for an agency head means little in practice. Only five of the last 15 NSF directors served out a full six-year term. And similarly, in, uh, similar instability has been the norm for FAA, despite the five-year term for its administrators. I could go on, but the reality is that we don't need to set up a new bureaucracy outside of NASA 
or alter the appointment process for its leaders. If we're interested in ensuring stability at NASA, it is already in our power as Congress to do so. We are the ones who ultimately determine NASA's budget. We can provide the necessary budgetary stability to NASA, or we can destabilize it with appropriation delays, continuing resolutions, and shutdowns. The choice is ours. It's right here in this committee. In addition, we have the ability to set a stable direction for NASA. And we did just that in 2015 NASA reauthorization bill that passed the House. We see that Mars should be the goal of our human exploration program. The president has agreed, though that was determined before he became president. We should take that consensus and build on it rather than having an unelected board put forth its own exploration vision every four years. The two congressional actions that I have just described, one budgetary and one policy oriented, will do more to maintain space leadership and ensure stability at NASA than anything we might do in this bill that we are discussing today. So in closing, I again want to welcome our witnesses. I appreciate your service and I look forward to your testimony. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Our witness on the first panel today is the Honorable John Culberson, Chairman of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, and Science. Culberson, excuse me, Congressman Culberson represents the 7th District of Texas, a district formerly represented by President George H.W. Bush. A longtime space enthusiast, Chairman Culberson is the sponsor of H.R. 2093, the Space Leadership Preservation Act of 2015. We thank him for being here this morning and look forward to hearing about his bill. And the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. John, make sure your mic is on there. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank you, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Johnson, for hosting this meeting, uh, holding this hearing today, and to, to review the Space Leadership Preservation Act 2015. I also want to uh, thank your staff, uh, particularly Chris Shank and Tom Hammond, for working with me and my staff on this important legislation. Chairman Smith, uh, thank you for supporting this bill as an original co-sponsor. I'm deeply grateful for your uh, for your confidence and support on this important uh, on this important matter. And also want to thank your fellow committee members, uh, Representatives uh, Sensenbrenner, uh, Posey, and Bridenstine for their support as co-sponsors. I especially want to thank uh, my predecessor as the uh, Congressman Frank Wolf, who chaired the Commerce, Justice, Science uh, Committee and helped me uh, develop this legislation originally because Frank saw, as I have, as all of you have, it is uh, we, we simply have to give NASA greater stability. We need to make this agency less political, more professional, and give them the uh, ability to see uh, uh, in far into the future with the uh, knowledge and with the confidence that, uh, that the Congress uh, will be there behind them. I have uh, uh, some of my very best memories as a, as a boy growing up in Houston of into the space program. I've been a, all my earliest heroes were the Apollo uh, astronauts. I think I, I got my first telescope for Christmas when I was 12. I've had one ever since. Uh, bought myself a rather large telescope as a high school graduation present. Uh, these men and women have been heroes uh, to all Americans. And uh, when I uh, was assigned to the Appropriations Committee, I asked uh, uh, but one thing. I wanted to be to serve on the Commerce Justice Science Committee and one day be there to uh, chair it. And it is, uh, it's an extraordinary privilege for me to work with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, and all the members of this committee as we do our best arm in arm and uh, to make sure that NASA has the funding, the support that they need to do all that's on their uh, plate. Uh, I have in this, uh, in the appropriations bill that the Congress just approved, uh, I made certain that NASA has uh, today the largest appropriation that they have ever received since the agency was created in 1958. Mm. And I will continue to make sure that NASA has the resources they need to accomplish all that is before them. And, and, uh, but that, again, is a year-to-year -year effort. That is, again, a year, something that is, uh, tends to be, uh, uh, to, it, it, it is uh, often too reliant too much on who is in the White House and who holds the chairmanships of these, uh, of these important subcommittees. I also want to be sure to thank uh, my counterpart in the Senate, uh, Senator Richard Shelby, who chairs the Senate uh, Commerce Justice Science Committee. He's an ardent supporter of the space program, and it's been absolutely vital to have him there for his support. 
you know, although it's been over 44 years since any human has set foot on the surface of another uh, celestial body, when uh, Gene Cernan, my constituent and good friend, and Harrison Schmidt left the moon after three days exploring the uh, Taurus Littrow Lunar Valley, a mission control in Houston read a statement from the White House to the Apollo 17 astronauts that said, as the Challenger leaves the surface of the moon, we are conscious not of what we leave behind, but of what lies before us. But today, the glory days of the Apollo program seem to be uh, behind us, and the country seems to have lost focus on exploring uh, what lies uh, before us, or all the wonder that would be, as Tennyson said so well. Uh, the team at NASA, unfortunately, has faced uh, program cancellation after program cancellation. As Mike Griffin points out so correctly in his testimony you'll hear in a moment, Dr. Griffin points out as the year 2009 opened, uh, we had a plan for our nation's space program, a plan of generational scope for what it was that NASA expected to do. But by early uh, 2010, barely a year later, this carefully hewn strategy that had been approved twice by Congress in two successive authorization acts of 2005 and 2008, Dr. Griffin points out, had been abandoned and canceled. And I have a, a, a chart here that I've, I'll make sure each one of you have a copy of that Mike Coates, the director at the Johnson Space Center, first pointed out to me that uh, this is the fundamental problem at NASA that in the last 20 years, NASA has spent more than $20 billion on canceled development programs. No, no, no entity, no company, no entity, no agency of the federal government, no agency of any state government or local government can function in this environment. And think of the heartbreak. Uh, uh, Brian Babin, my good friend and colleague uh, from, uh, from the east side of Houston, represents the Johnson Space Center. Uh, we all know the heartbreak that those great men and women, those brilliant engineers and scientists who have devoted their life to making the dreams of the future come true, to build these incredible machines, these great rockets and spacecraft, they pour their heart and soul into it, yet only to have it yanked out from underneath them. Uh, that is very, very damaging uh, to their morale and destructive to our space program as a whole. This is not a partisan issue. Completely set politics aside. Now forget who's in the White House, what party label. It's, it's just intensely destructive and we cannot uh, continue. It's wasteful, uh, damaging, and it, it, just, it damages our ability as a nation to preserve our leadership in space. And space is the high ground. I cannot imagine General Meade at Gettysburg abandoning Little Round Top, just giving it over. You do not surrender the high ground. And yet I'm very concerned that in the absence of stability, uh, in the absence of uh, giving uh, NASA a greater level of professionalism and making them less political, uh, that the country is going to wind up abandoning the high ground. The, uh, uh, there is no clear mission today, and we simply have to come up with a way to give the agency uh, the ability to give us that vision uh, and with the guidance and support of Congress, make that come true. I had uh, the chance, uh, the honor recently to hear former Navy SEAL Robert O'Neill speak about his work and, and uh, identifying and taking out Osama bin Laden. And one of the things that really struck, stuck with me from Rob's remarks was he said that a lack of a clear mission hurts morale. That's true of all of us as human beings, and it's certainly true of the team uh, at NASA. And that uh, uh, we can help make that, uh, fix that problem with this legislation. I have uh, uh, welcomed suggestions or ideas on how we can uh, modify uh, the legislation, but I put a lot of thought into this. With your help, uh, Chairman Smith and, and uh, Chairman Frank Wolf, uh, we looked at the, uh, some of the models in government that work well. The director of the FBI, for example, has uh, that has, the 10 year term for the director of the FBI is serving very well. We know that the FBI is uh, a pillar of integrity, and that director does not think about politics or, uh, or, or who the president is. They focus on enforcing the law and doing the right thing for the right reasons uh, for the country. Uh, these, uh, uh, whether it is the, the President, uh, Ms. Johnson, or whether it's the uh, Congress, your human nature being what we are, there's going to be politics either way. And the idea of the Board of Directors was to make sure that we had members from both parties recommending uh, appointments to that uh, board who would have to then be submitted uh, by the President to the Senate for confirmation, uh, preserving the uh, separation of powers and the executive's role in making that appointment so there are no constitutional issues and you also have both parties and both houses of uh, Congress having an impact on that uh, board of directors. The, uh, uh, the idea of the uh, budget being submitted directly to Congress is important because if we don't, all of us, none of us know exactly what NASA's best minds uh, have recommended 
they submit their budget to the Office of Management and Budget, and the budget that we get, Mr. Chairman, and the budget that I receive, the budget recommendation from the President, is not really from NASA. It's from OMB. Uh, as a practical matter, we all know that OMB runs NASA today. The bureaucrats, the bean counters at OMB are the ones making the big decisions for our nation's space program, and it's just unacceptable. I'd like to know, as I know you would, an honest, accurate number. Uh, what do the best minds at NASA recommend to the Congress? What's necessary for you to achieve all that's before you? And that's the idea behind the direct budget submission, Ms. Johnson, that we would, as members of Congress, receive a budget submission from the Board of Directors at NASA. They, we would also get OMB's recommendation, but then we can lay them down side by side and see what is necessary to make those dreams of the future come true and, and balance them and figure out what is necessary to, uh, uh, for, the, for American taxpayers to, uh, to fund that recommendation. Uh, that longer term for the administrator, I think, is not only necessary for stability to make the agency uh, head less political, but to give uh, that individual the time to make sure that these tremendously complicated and expensive uh, spaceflight programs uh, come to fruition so we don't see this start and stop as you see on this chart uh, right here. <clears throat> Finally, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I really think that this, uh, con the, from my experience working in, uh, in the Congress, I started out here on this committee and, and when I went to the Appropriations Committee and was able to see, as you have, the, uh, the extraordinary men and women at NASA who, have, uh, who are so dedicated to make sure that the American space program is the best on Earth. To, who are so dedicated to make sure that the, the spacecraft and the rockets they build are, are truly the best that have ever been uh, uh, conceived or built by human hands. Uh, I keep coming back to the fundamental problem, the cause of the instability, is governance. It's, we could continue to fund NASA, we, we can continue down this path of year-to-year pillar-to-post uh, funding, or we could make fundamental long-term changes that our successors will uh, inherit a agency that is less political, more professional, more stable, more focused on making the dreams of the future come true, more focused on achieving the goals of the decadal survey. Quite frankly, I'd I wish one thing that you could add, I'd love to figure out a way to have a, a human spaceflight decadal survey. The scientists at the National uh, Academy of Sciences do a great job when they prepare the decadal survey for astrophysics, for earth sciences, for heliophysics, for planetary science. And you'll see in my CJS bill, I wired in there that NASA shall follow the recommendations of the decadal survey as they prepare what is necessary for missions in the future. And I made certain they got the money to do it. But what I can't figure out and resolve is how do you have a decadal survey for human spaceflight without having all those conflicting uh, passions from the different contractors that are involved. That's a challenge that I'd hope ask for the help of the Science Committee in resolving. But it is governance. It all circles back to governance. And if we want to ensure that America maintains its leadership role in outer space, if we want to make sure that we're protecting the high ground, then that our children and grandchildren will live to see interstellar flight, that they'll live to see the discovery of life on other worlds, I encourage you, I urge you to join me in passing this legislation and uh, modifying it, make it better, mm -hmm. and help us find a way to give NASA uh, the stability that they need at headquarters, uh, again, to make those dreams of the future come true. And I thank you very much thank for having me here today. Uh, Chairman Culberson, thank you for the comments about your bill, and also thank you for all you have done for NASA over the years and into the future as well. Uh, <clears throat> you are welcome to join us up here if you'd like to, to listen to the next expert uh, panel. And we are going to take a brief recess while the witness uh, table is prepared for the next panel. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, while we're taking a recess, I understand that the uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, the chairman of the Space Subcommittee, is recognized for an opening statement, if he'd like to make one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning with our esteemed colleague and our first witness, as we just heard, uh, Chairman uh, John Culberson. And I represent the 36th District of Texas, which is the home of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, I've had the privilege of visiting uh, JSC on a number of occasions, and every time I stop by there, I am reminded of the truly extraordinary accomplishments <clears throat> that we have made as a nation. I'm also inspired by the potential that exists at NASA to continue expanding our horizons deeper into space. 
It's truly an awe-inspiring mission that is pursued with dedication by NASA's personnel and its contractors. Space exploration and science captures the American people's interests. It inspires us to pursue extraordinary goals and keeps us <clears throat> on the forefront of scientific achievement. It is a challenging endeavor that distinguishes the United States as a global leader. It supports innovation and economic growth and inspires the next generation to build, explore, and discover. The missions of NASA uh, that we should be focused on are complex, uh, they are expensive, and they are long-term. Unfortunately, the last eight years have been characterized by turmoil and by upheaval and uncertainty. And if there's anything that we have learned from this experience, it is that our national space program can ill afford to change our program of record every time that there is a new president. Space exploration requires stability and unwavering dedication. Chairman Culberson, a strong supporter and good friend of our nation's space program, has been vocal, as you heard this morning, about how the billions of dollars have been dedicated, directed, and redirected over the years with fits and starts of various NASA projects. Your pursuit of a solution to this challenge, Representative Culberson, is greatly appreciated by me and many of our colleagues. Space exploration is a very worthwhile investment for the taxpayer and for the nation. It inspires the next generation of explorers to pursue science, technology, engineering, and math. It advances U.S. soft power and international relations. It reinforces our aerospace industrial base, increases economic competitiveness, and advances our national security interests. There's a great deal of promise in the future of space, but if we fail to provide the stability for NASA's space exploration programs, we may well lose our leadership in space. Make no mistake, other nations are nipping in our heels and we can ill afford to rest on our laurels. Losing U.S. leadership in space will significantly undermine our national interests, erode our industrial base, undermine our international influence, and cause the loss of a skilled workforce and will jeopardize our national security. Our colleague Bill Posey often says that the Chinese are going to the moon and they're not going there just to collect rocks, and I couldn't agree more. Mr. Culberson's Space Leadership Preservation Act offers us an opportunity to review many of the challenges facing our nation's space agency. There may be many ways to achieve the goals of this legislation, and so I have an open mind. Presidential elections offer both challenges and opportunities, and that's why it is imperative that our colleagues in the Senate consider the bipartisan NASA Authorization Act that passes via unanimous consent over a year ago. They must bring this up. NASA would be well served by the guidance that this legislation provides. It would provide stability of purpose in an uncertain time. All that they would have to do is update the funding levels to match the recently passed omnibus appropriations levels for NASA. And I appreciate the hearing, the testimony of Representative Culberson and looking forward to hearing our other distinguished uh, witnesses this morning. And I thank them for appearing here. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Babin. Um, we are awaiting the arrival of a member of the Science Committee, the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, who is going to introduce our first witness, Dr. Griffin. And while, while he is on the way, I'm going to proceed and introduce our other two witnesses today. And our second witness is Colonel Eileen Collins, retired United States Air Force Colonel and former NASA astronaut and resident of my hometown, San Antonio. Colonel Collins was selected by NASA to become an astronaut in 1991. In 1995, she flew the space shuttle as pilot aboard Discovery and then again as pilot in 1997 aboard Atlantis. Colonel Collins became the first woman commander of a U.S. spacecraft with shuttle mission Columbia in 1999. Her final space flight mission was as commander of Discovery in 2005, the return to flight mission. 
She has logged more than 6,750 hours in 30 different types of aircraft and more than 870 hours in space as a veteran of four space flights. Colonel Collins received her bachelor's degree in mathematics and economics from Syracuse University, her master of science degree in operations from Stanford University, and a master of arts degree in space systems management from Webster University. Our final witness is Ms. Christina Chaplin, Director of Acquisitions and Sourcing Management at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Ms. Chaplin has the responsibility of GAO assessments of military space acquisitions, NASA, and the Missile Defense Agency. Prior to her current position at GAO, she worked with GAO's financial management and information technology teams. She has been with GAO for 25 years. Ms. Chaplin received her bachelor's degree from Boston University and her master's degree from Columbia University. Okay, um, I'm sure that uh, the gentleman from Alabama will be joining us, joining us shortly, but in his absence, I'm going to go on and introduce our, our first witness today. And uh, that is Dr. Michael Griffin, former NASA Administrator and current Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Schaefer Corporation. Dr. Griffin served as both Chief Engineer and Associate Administrator for Exploration at NASA, as well as Deputy for Technology at the Strategic Def Defense Initiative Organization. Dr. Griffin is the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal and the Department of Defense's Distinguished Public Service Medal, the highest award which can be conferred on a non-government employee. Dr. Griffin received his bachelor's degree in physics from Johns Hopkins University and master's degrees in aerospace science from Catholic University, electrical electrical engineering from the University of Southern California, applied physics from Johns Hopkins, civil engineering from George Washington University, and business administration from Loyola College of Maryland. By my count, that's five master's degrees. And his PhD is in aerospace engineering from the University of Maryland. Uh, we welcome you, through, all three of you, to the to the hearing today, and the gentleman from Alabama has arrived, but I still want to recognize him, even though I just finished introducing Dr. Griffin. I know that the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, will have some comments to make as well, and he is recognized for that purpose. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, this is my <laughs> third hearing since 9.30. Um, from what I understand, you've already introduced uh, I'm, I just, Dr. Griffin. I just finished, but I'd like to recognize you to make any additional comments you'd like to make. Well, Dr. Griffin, thank you for being here. Roll Tide and War Eagle. I'll make it short. <laughs> In that case, we will proceed. And Dr. Griffin, you're uh, welcome to start your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Smith, uh, Chairman Culbertson, Mr. Brooks, uh, for the kind introduction and recognition. Uh, I'm and. Uh, Thank you, Ranking Member Johnson and members of the committee for appearing here today uh, and allowing me to appear to discuss the future of our nation's space program. With the inauguration of a new administration and Congress, uh, we will have both the need and the opportunity to restore American preeminence in space and after that to ensure stability in the policy and programs we create. We should begin now, and in that context, it may be of some value to review some of our recent history. Um, some of that has been summarized by Chairman Culbertson in the earlier panel, and I will not repeat it. I will make the point that following the loss of Space Shuttle Columbia, the uh, Columbia Accident Investigation Board identified as one of the root causes of that failure the lack of a clearly identifiable long-term strategic plan for NASA. As has been stated, uh, by 2009, that issue had been remedied, and we were executing a powerful and compelling new plan. That plan respected the need to complete existing commitments, the constraints imposed by the geography of the solar system, and the existing state of our technology and operational experience. The plan respected the need of our international partners for a roadmap for human spaceflight beyond the International Space Station while offering critical challenges 
to which they could make critical contributions. Finally, being achievable with only incremental real dollar budget growth, it respected realistic budget constraints. It was a good plan. This strategy received nearly unanimous bipartisan endorsement by successive Congresses, Republican and Democratic, in the NASA Authorization Acts of 2005 and 2008, clearing the path for a period of unimpeded progress. And by early 2009, the shuttle was flying regularly, the ISS was nearing completion, a new crew transportation system was in work, and the first two contracts for commercial cargo delivery to the International Space Station had been signed. Some 14 nations had embraced partnership with the United States to return to the moon and were orienting their own national space policies to that end. But by early 2010, uh, just a year later, this strategy was in disarray. Human lunar return had been abandoned, as had NASA's development of a new crew transportation system. There was no plan beyond ISS, save for a nebulous commitment to visit an asteroid sometime in the 2020s. Inasmuch as this, uh, such a mission is inherently a one-off exercise with limited opportunities for international involvement, our existing space station partners rightly felt abandoned, and potential new partners saw very little merit in working with the United States. The nations that were eager to participate in space exploration in 2009 still wish to do so today. But a leader is needed for such an endeavor, and for now the only possible leader is the United States. If we do not choose to engage, then eventually other nations will, and we're unlikely to be pleased with that result. This is not a future that the United States should allow to come to pass. Our space policy is bankrupt. While I certainly support the stability for NASA that the, is the top of, topic of this hearing today, I would not want that desire to prevent us from correcting the problems that have been created over the last seven years. To quote my friend and colleague Jim Albaugh, the fo former Boeing commercial aircraft CEO, the current administration's plan for space offers, and I quote, no dream, no vision, no plan, no budget, and no remorse, end quote. We can fix this, and we must. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. Uh, Colonel Collins. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Johnson and committee members. It is a pleasure for me to be here today to talk about the future of our great country and to share my perspective as a former space shuttle commander. I have a passion for exploration and I'm firmly committed to the future successes of our country's space program. A few words about my background. I'm a former Air Force test pilot, a graduate of the Air Force Test Pilot School, and a veteran of four space flights. I served for five years on the NASA Advisory Council from 2007 to 2011. I currently serve on the National Academy of Sciences, Aerospace Science and Engineering Board. Um, and although I serve on this and many other boards and advisory panels, um, I want to say that I'm here today representing myself and not any of these other panels. <coughs> so in my opening comments, I have uh, three general points. Uh, the first one is I want to thank you for asking the opinion of the operators of our space systems, or the guys in the trenches, so to speak. I hope I can give you an operational perspective from an astronaut's point of view. Secondly, I can't emphasize enough the love that Americans have for our space program. As a speaker and as an advisor, I routinely meet people from all around the United States. They are inspired by human spaceflight, and they are very excited about scientific discoveries. They see the space program as a bright future where we can imagine, imagine possibilities, both human and technical. And frankly, the brand of NASA is easy to love. For example, my story began in the fourth grade when I read a magazine article about the Gemini astronauts. Since then, I've wanted to fly in space and to be part of this great adventure. It led me to study mathematics and a career in flying. Today, I see people of all ages light up when the subject of space travel is discussed. In my opinion, 
the history of American exploration is right up there with baseball, apple pie, and the 4th of July. And I might add that the recent announcement for new astronauts brought a record number of applicants, 18,300 applicants, which is more than twice as many as the previous record. Now, my third point concerns the purpose and stability of the human spaceflight program. Obviously, the success of any decades-long program is related to the long-term commitment from the top. So first, a mission is defined. Next, a strategy is set. And then, an operational plan is written. Now, that operational plan includes a test plan. And a test plan includes a build-up approach. This is one of the fundamentals that we learn when we go through and that we teach when we go through the uh, test pilot schools. As we run a test program, occasionally technical changes will need to be made because we learn as we go. Sometimes we make mistakes when we do things for the first time. But necessary technical changes will not affect the originally defined mission. That must stay stable so that the team members can stay focused on the mission. I understand that the long-range vision for, US human space, for the U.S. human spaceflight program is landing a human on Mars. I support that mission, and I sincerely hope that that first person is an American. We can do it, and frankly, we can afford it. Those who say we can't are just putting their priorities elsewhere. When asked about how to best prepare for a successful Mars mission, as a crew member, I certainly would like to see the hardware tested on the moon's surface first. This is part of a test plan's build-up approach. Policy leaders are asking astronauts to risk their lives on space journeys, and it is our experience that testing in similar environments like the moon will minimize risk. When the Constellation program was canceled in 2010, some people said, why go back to the moon? We've already been there. Imagine the year 1806 when Lewis and Clark returned from their two and a half year journey of exploring the Western continent. They and their team members are declared national heroes. But then no one else goes back because we had already been there. Of course, this is almost inconceivable. It would diminish the entire reason for going in the first place. I was a member of the NASA Advisory Council when Constellation was canceled. I was shocked, as were my colleagues, first, because it was so unexpected, and second, because the timing so close to the end of the space shuttle program left NASA with no options. The legislation that we're discussing here today has ideas that will certainly address this problem. I'm not wedded to any specific proposal myself, but the problem does need to be addressed, especially given the billions of dollars wasted as a result in the lost time and motivations of engineers and astronauts. I believe program cancellation decisions are made, that are made by bureaucracies behind closed doors without input by the people, are divisive, damaging, cowardly, and many times more expensive in the long run. As a shuttle commander, I would never make a huge decision without input from all the experts, even the ones that I don't agree with. So what will keep us from having surprises like this set us back years? A continuity of purpose, over many years and political administrations. I know there are ways to do this through policy, organizational structure, and strong leadership. And finally, strategic stability will give the teams efficiency and a focus that we saw in the Apollo program. Apollo happened by the end of the decade because people knew exactly what the mission was and when it should happen. They believed in it, and of course it was properly funded. There was not much division over what the mission was, and NASA was given the responsibility to figure out how to do it, and the result was dedication, passion, and success. And I know we can do this again. Thank you.
Thank you, Colonel Collins and Ms. Chaplin. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the Space Leadership Preservation Act. You've heard the policy and strategic perspective, as well as the operational perspective, and I'm here today to discuss the acquisition management perspective. As you know, NASA's acquisition management has been on GAO's high-risk list for more than two decades because of persistent cost growth and schedule slippage. In recent years, however, NASA has made progress in reducing this risk. Specifically, in 2012, shortly after NASA rebaselined its largest project, the James Webb Telescope, development cost growth averaged about 46 percent. This year, we plan to report that it is 17 percent. And when James Webb is excluded, cost growth is just 1.3 percent, though that number is affected by the addition of Space Launch System and Orion to the portfolio. NASA has made positive changes in the past five years that have helped contribute to the improved performance of its projects. These include better cost and schedule estimating, use of management reserves, and program monitoring. Moreover, many projects are able to demonstrate that they have closed gaps in knowledge about technology and design at key junctures in their development process. This does not mean NASA's acquisition problems are solved. Several projects in the portfolio are experiencing significant problems that are not just the result of inherent technical risk. Programs still struggle with underestimating complexity and managing and overseeing contractors. Moreover, the most complex and costly development efforts, the human spaceflight projects and James Webb, are entering their most risky phases of development. Before we can take NASA off our high-risk list, we need to see how these projects perform in times when they are most tested. Further, while initial estimates are realistic, more realistic, we are finding larger projects do not plan to update their estimates on a regular basis, and that estimates are not always well supported by well-defined schedules. The baselines for human spaceflight projects also provide little visibility into long-term planning and costs. Today, this committee is discussing the concern that NASA needs more stability in order to truly thrive. That is what the Space Leadership Preservation Act is focused on. The concept of stability is an important one for NASA, since projects require heavy investments, both in terms of time and money, and they require the cooperation and support from a variety of communities. We have not assessed the extent to which the act can insulate NASA from instability, but I do have a couple observations. First, if NASA were to implement a board of directors, that board must be willing to hold program managers accountable, as well as leadership, by canceling or restructuring programs that do not perform well. I recognize there is a frustration that shuttle successor programs never seem to make it very far, and it's clear that these programs are impacted by politics. On the other hand, when projects prove to be too ambitious or poorly managed, not canceling them or not changing them can be damaging to the rest of NASA's portfolio. Second, the act emphasizes the use of longer term or multi-year contracts. Multi-year contracts can potentially save money and improve the industrial base by permitting more efficient use of a contractor's resources. It's important to keep in mind, however, that they are generally used for more production items and low risk technology. Not too many NASA projects fit this description. Multi-year contracts can also reduce Congress's flexibility as well as the agency's flexibility in making changes to programs and budgets, so the decision to use them needs to be carefully considered. Finally, as you assess these measures, I would like to emphasize that our examinations of complex acquisitions across the government continually show that acquisition success hinges on, one, having robust long-term plans to guide programs, Two, having a sound business case when starting a program. Three, providing the right support and oversight throughout the life of the program. We look forward to con continuing to work with NASA and the committee in instituting these improvements. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Chaplin, and thank you all for your testimony today. Appreciate your candor and directness both. Uh, Dr. Griffin, let me address my first question to you, and actually this is a question from Chairman Culberson. And that is, how would you design a process to create a human space flight decadal survey? 
such a question reminds me of a wry joke among engineers about the dangers of doing math in public. <laughs> um, with that in mind, uh, I, I think I might offer some broad comments, okay. but and I would be more than willing to uh, discuss the question offline uh, okay. with committee and staff, but um, the details are probably not best hammered out here. I would say broadly that in order to craft a plan of, of decadal scope, um, a, a process much like what science does uh, in, in their various disciplines would be, would be helpful. Um, one would have to gather together uh, recognized experts in human spaceflight ranging from operators to, uh, in, in, in point of fact, philosophers. Why are we doing this in the first place? Uh, these were the kinds of questions that were addressed uh, in the period following the loss of Columbia and that did allow us to come up with what I thought was a plan, uh, a quality plan of decadal scope. Okay. The key to such a plan is having as many um, knowledgeable stakeholders as possible contributing to it, having it done in the open, and then having the opportunity to discuss it and debate it when it is done, rather than having it, as Colonel Collins suggested, um, foisted upon us as a surprise. Okay, thank you, Dr. Griffin. We'll look forward to a further discussion on the subject with you as well. I would as well, sir, thank you. Great. Uh, Colonel Collins, does NASA have a set of clearly defined strategic goals and objectives? And if not, what should those goals and objectives be? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. That um, I think it depends on your perspective because some say yes and some say no. So I think at the top, NASA does have a final goal of landing a crew on Mars approximately 2030, 2033. But how you get there is, is where there is maybe disagreement. Um, or some confusion, possibly, on how we're going to do that, because the mission has changed, and NASA has defined the roadmaps, and they are in those National Academy of Sciences uh, studies that have been published, uh, one in 2012 and one in 2014. We go there by using uh, the moon as a test bed, or by visiting an asteroid, and I realize the asteroid mission has changed Several times it was originally um, astronauts would visit an asteroid and work there. And as time went on, the asteroid got smaller. Um, it was difficult to find the right asteroid. One of the problems is these asteroids are moving around in space, so they're not always where you think they're supposed to be. Uh, you have to project it where it's going to be in the future. And then if your mission delays, that's going to change uh, some of the planning and possibly may, may even change the destination to a different asteroid. And of course, they're all, these asteroids are different, and they have different makeups, different sizes. So NASA then decided to capture an asteroid and bring it to the uh, lunar space, do that robotically, and then have astronauts visit. So uh, that mission has changed because as we go along, we find that there's technical difficulties. So I see that that's where the uh, disagreement is in the scientific and operational community as to how we should do that mission. Most people agree that we need to go to Mars. The problem is how do we get there? Thank you, Colonel Collins. And Ms. Chaplin, uh, what are your recommendations for how NASA should address their deficiency in their proposal to go to Mars? <laughs> mm. I, th I think the long-term planning is very critical here and um, they do definitely need a strategic plan that, again, lays out how they're going to get there, also what technologies you need to get there. There's many more systems and subsystems that are going to need to be developed for the eventual trip to Mars. And to also have cost estimates, at least in ranges, for the different kinds of choices that you can make. Um, at this point, we only have cost estimates going up through the second flight for Orion and nothing after that. And for SLS, we only have cost estimates going up through the first flight. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of important questions ahead about how much is everything going to cost and what else do you need to get in order to get there. 
Okay. Thank you, Ms. Champlin. Uh, the ranking member, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson, is recognized for her questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Chaplin, based on uh, GAO's uh, work on NASA, what are the top two issues that need to be addressed to ensure stability in NASA's programs over the long term? Uh, what should Congress do uh, to address those? And would any of the other witnesses care to comment after you, you may? So that's a good question. I think it speaks to the levels of discussion that we're having. One is a good strategic long-term plan that helps provide stability. And the plan itself, if it has agreement from a lot of different communities, you have a better chance of maintaining support over the decades that need to happen. Um, but at the more tactical level, acquisition programs have to be well managed too. And Congress has done a lot for NASA in that regard um, by helping them get more transparency into costs and progress, instituting good metrics and project management tools. There's always more that can be done, especially in terms of holding programs accountable when they, they don't meet their goals and they don't have good plans for going forward. But I see the solution as being on both those levels. Any other witnesses, Gary? No, I don't need to comment further at this time. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. okay. The question was on the top two things that NASA could do. I think that, although I'm not a policy or budget expert, I think that there may be something in the uh, multi-year funding uh, that seems to make sense. And the other comment I have is on uh, the board of directors that we had uh, heard mentioned earlier today. I think the key thing about having a board of directors and adding stability is getting the right people on that board that are entirely independent. And I serve on several boards and I think the key to having a board that works very well and very healthy is getting people that love the mission, have a passion for the mission, and are good listeners and can listen to all sides of the issue before they come in uh, with their uh, recommendation and their good governance. So I, th I think that where there could be problems with that, I think it's something that's worthy of looking at. Thank you. Uh, this committee and Congress will be considering and deliberating on the budget, uh, the President's fiscal year budget 2017 in the coming weeks. Uh, what, in your view, are the top three challenges for NASA over the next two years? All of them. Uh, Ms. Johnson, um, I don't know that I would have a top three. I think the topic of this hearing today is a critical one. Uh, what should NASA be doing? What, what as a nation do we want to do with our civil space program? I, I personally have been very clear that I think the proper next step is a human lunar return uh, that will occupy us in the near term and allow us to cement the international partnerships that helped us to build the space station. Beyond that, we should, be, we should be doing everything that we do in returning to the moon in such a way that it has maximum applicability toward going to Mars. Um, as Colonel Collins has said, this is something the United States can do, and I believe it's something that we should do. And so if I get my top three, the third thing I would say is once these goals are locked in place by the legislature, uh, I, I think we need a, a cultural change. Our space program is not something which the nation can afford to have be a playground for, for newly elected presidents and unelected staff. Um, the legislature is the proper repository of the long-term stability in these plans and programs that we need, and it, and it needs to be enforced. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I had a minute to think about the question. Mm -hmm. um, you asked about the top three uh, important things for NASA. Um, I would say first is, is uh, most people know American astronauts right now have to go to Russia and train in Russia to get to our space station. Um, so of course, a very top issue is getting a uh, launch from our country's soil, our astronauts to our space station, which I understand is funded through 2024. Uh, the second, I believe, is heavy launch 
obviously, for our long-term space goals. And the third is getting the best people. We need to get the smartest people into NASA by going out and recruiting. And the best way to do that is having a mission that they believe in. I'd like to echo my support for um, Eileen's comment that we need to restore American access to space as soon as possible. I, I, that might have been something I was assuming was a given, and uh, I think I should state it explicitly. Thank you. My time has expired, but I'd like you to comment if you could. So I'll, I'll be quick in light of that. Um, to add to the conversation, just to note that some of the largest programs will be entering their most difficult phases of development where we tend to see more cost growth and more problems. So getting through those couple of years of ensuring issues that happen on these huge programs don't affect and overwhelm the smaller programs that are equally important. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Johnson. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for scheduling the uh, Space Leadership Preservation Act hearing. Uh, thank all the panelists for appearing and for the wisdom and foresight that uh, you've shared with us so far. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of criticism from uh, different directions about this proposed legislation, but I've not heard one single person propose an actual solution to the problem that we have uh, of lack of programming and, and foresight and how we're going to get on track and stay on track and keep America's space program first. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, you brushed over the beginning uh, a litany of events that kind of throws us into uh, instability even more. I mean, we have, we have a candidate that runs for office that says if he's elected president, he's going to abolish NASA and put the money in education. Then when he appears on the Space Coast, he says, I'm going to close the gap between uh, the shuttle and Constellation and keep America first in space. Then he gets elected and he asks for the NASA Administrator's resignation. And he doesn't fill the position. So when they're doing their planning and strategic planning for the uh, uh, administration's uh, future, the NASA Administrator's seat is empty. That's kind of a shame. So then we get, finally get a, a great NASA administrator appointed, and then we have an Augustine Commission appointed. I may have these two out of order a little bit to tell him what to do. And the Augustine Commission says, of course, the shuttle is terribly dangerous and needs to be scuttled. Uh, we all know better than that. We know they were designed for over 100 missions, and uh, they were only the 35th mission. It's mile per mile is safest space travel, spacest travel of any kind in the history of mankind. Uh, and we know the catastrophes, the tragedies were human error. It wasn't any failure of, of NASA. And so then we go in a different direction and, and, and we have SLS and Orion now, which I think are great plans, great goals. Uh, but we have an administration that, frankly, underfunds them. They suggest them, promote them, and then underfund them. Uh, so then NASA ends up uh, being criticized that they can't keep up schedules that they've foreseen before, and we know when you delay projects and instability, it's going to cost, cost increases too. So, um, you know, you have to wonder if, if, if you are NASA or you're a NASA employee or a potential NASA employee or even just a bright STEM student or like the 18,000 who applied to be astronauts, what is our future going to be? What is our future going to be? And, and I love Neil deGrasse Tyson when he says, you know, that our investment in space is fundamentally, basically, the only thing our Congress does strictly for future generations, to benefit future generations. And so I think uh, Congressman Culberson's bill is, is much too important to ignore, not only for those reasons, but for reasons of national security, uh, our technological advancement, and eventually the survival of our species. Uh, now. You know, Dr. Griffin and Colonel Collins, China is rapidly developing the uh, capability to access and use all regions of cislunar space. Uh, if the United States cedes that and moon base uh, soil use to China, uh, what do you foresee as the strategic and long-term impacts on the uh, national interest 
of our country. Well, you mentioned me first, so I'll go first. Uh, Mr. Posey, thank you. Um, I have a couple of comments on that. First of all, I think you can infer all that needs to be inferred about how the Chinese will behave in space by watching today how they are behaving in the Western Pacific and the concern that that causes uh, not only the United States, uh, but all nations in that region. Uh, there is no reason to suppose that they would behave any differently in space, and I think that should give us concern. More broadly, um, since World War II, the United States has been uh, a superpower, and one certainly would say, I think, the superpower in the world. Um, the world is a better place when that situation is so. I, I believe Western values and customs and respect for individual rights and the rule of law uh, matter. If we want those cultural values to prevail upon the, in the new frontier that is space, then we will have to be there. The decisions are made by the people who show up, not by the people who watch on TV. Um, for those reasons, which I believe are existential for our culture, uh, we need to be in space first among equals, irrespective of what China or any other nation seeks to do. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel? When the Apollo 11 crew landed on the moon in 1969, they put a plaque that said, we came in peace for all mankind. <clears throat> I'm not sure China would put a plaque like that on the moon. Um, I am concerned about China. I'm not an expert on China, so I get that in the record. But I'm not sure what their intentions are. And as Dr. Griffin said, they're, we can only guess based on what they're doing now, what their performance is. We don't really cooperate with China in space, although we cooperate with all other nations, and I believe in international cooperation. Um, whether or not we cooperate with the Chinese is a big question mark. Um, it's just a little bit, a little bit scary. And, and sometimes part of me says competition is good in many ways. And if we ever end up in a race back to the moon against China, um, that might give us a little kick in the pants. Okay. to get out there and do it, whether it's the moon or Mars or whatever we're doing in space. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Posey. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, is up next. I'm way down here. Um, thank you very much uh, to the panelists. Uh, thank you to Chairman Culberson for uh, bringing his bill before us. And there are a lot of principles that I think we all share. Sometimes you lose sight of those when you take shots at each other's party or you're each other's president. I'd remind my friends on the Republican side of the aisle, I did the math, and I did this in public, 100, uh, 2016 minus 1972, it's been 44 years since we've been on the moon, and 24 of those years we've had Republican presidents, and 20 of those years we've had Democrats. So we need to get back into space, and whether so for me, and my colleagues know that I like this time frame to get us to Mars. When the planets line up, it's time to get there. We set an outside date, 2033. That's a responsibility of us on the political side, whether it's the administration or Congresses, which change every two years. So I'm going to give my friend, who's the chairman of CJS, the benefit of the doubt, because he's been through this. And if there is some way that we can put together a structure that takes out the vagaries of each congressional election and each pre presidential election and gets us to Mars by 2033, and you folks with the engineering degrees and the physics degrees and the accounting degrees figure out how to b put the building blocks in place, then I'm there. That's your job. My job is to find you the money. And we've had testimony that over the course of the, to get to Mars is 200 billion plus. That's a lot of money. 
but we found $800 billion for the banks over a weekend. We found $250 billion a year to be in Afghanistan and Iraq. We can do this. So I'd like to have some kind of structure at NASA that allows for long-term thinking. So I'll start with you, um, Ms. Collins. You said you didn't have a real um, position on, on the chairman's bill, but what would you do that, what would you say to me, how can we put long-term planning into place when we have two-year cycles for Congress and four-year cycles for the president? Well, thank you for the question. I think, well, first of all, let me say, our system of government is the greatest in the world, and I think that the uh, discussions that we have are wonderful. We get things out on the table. We have disagreements. I think in the end, the goal, everybody's goal is the same. We want to have a strong human spaceflight program with a mission. We want to succeed. We want to get there at the best cost, uh, and we want to do it safely. We don't want to hurt anybody in the process. My first answer, I would say, is don't give up. So this applies on all levels. I mean, we did give up on Constellation. Um, I think that the reason given was the, the cost, and yes, the cost was high. I mean, we all admit that, but instead of just giving up on the whole program, and I'm talking about not, not the past, I'm talking about the future here, if this happens again, let's just take a good hard look at can we, where can we cut the fat do we have the right people in there working the program? Maybe there's changes that need to be made, but we don't really need to give up on the end mission once that's been defined. We might need to change course a little, but keep, don't give up. Keep the, the mission in, in sight. Mind. So for me, and, and I really agree with a lot of the things that Mr. Posey said and some of the others, you know, that there, is, there are two pieces to this. One is our basic desire to learn science and exploration, to get to Mars, to be in space. The second is a national security question. And so between the two of them, we ought to be able to get out there and get going for a long time for however it might be. So Dr. Griffin, you've had your taste of political science and obviously you're a scientist as well. So as administrator, you know, you've been, you've run into both buzzsaws. So what, how would you, you know, just saying, hey, you guys got to have a longer term approach to this. What would be your view? How do we do it? Uh, thank you, Mr. Perlmutter. Uh, I, I cannot, I cannot resist going for the simplest possible explanation or, or recommendation. Um, I've been, been very clear in, in today's testimony and on earlier occasions that I very much admired the authorization bills of 2005 and 2008, which this Congress passed and frankly were originated in this committee. Uh, the, two, tw the 2010 bill was also a good bill. Um, when proposals are made by the executive branch that conflict with the existing law, why does Congress go along? I, I, I have to say, had Congress merely made it extraordinarily clear to the incoming administration that while that administration had many problems before it, space was not one of those problems, that the Congress had decided upon the space plan, the space policy of the United States, and that policy would be kept, had that been communicated, we would not be sitting there here having this hearing today. Um, I said earlier in my testimony that I regarded the Congress as the long-term um, body of stability, if, if you will, in the political system to, to capture uh, the, the, the desire that Americans generally have uh, for a particular course of action, to capture that in legislation, and to preserve it. If we treated our Navy the way that we treat NASA, in terms of stability, we would not be able to project power upon the oceans the way that we do. It takes as long to build an aircraft carrier as it took to go to the moon, even when people are really working hard at it. If we decided with every incoming in administration whether we were going to preserve aircraft carriers, the United States would have none. So I'll simplify my comments. The first recommendation I would have would be 
let us again, as we did after the loss of Columbia, decide as a nation what we want to see accomplished in space. Let us, as we did after Columbia, codify that into law, and then let us obey the law. Okay, thank, thank you, you sir. and I thank the chairman for letting me go over, and I want in the law that we're going to be on Mars by 2033. Uh, I'm not fighting that. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Pohlmutter. We're with you on 2033, and the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bridenstine, is recognized for his comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would like to say to my friend, uh, Mr. Perlmutter, actually to the chairman, if it's all right, I think we should have our own sticker that says 2032. We, uh, we don't want to settle for 2033. Republicans ought to go for 2032. <laughs> <clears throat> In 1982, uh, President Reagan reorganized our uh, Navy's nuclear propulsion program, citing the need to preserve structures and policies while ensuring the program continues to function smoothly and efficiently. He ordered that the director of this program of great national import be appointed for an eight-year term. This change ensured that the leadership and direction of our nuclear Navy remained constant over at least at least two presidential cycles, if not multiple administrations. Likewise, NASA is an agency carrying out programs of national importance, which by their very nature take years, as Dr. Griffin just talked about, if not decades, to formulate, develop, and carry out. It makes complete sense to me to remove the administrator of NASA from the political cycles in order to allow for continuity and stability. I am proud to be a co-sponsor of Chairman Culberson's bill, which proposes a 10-year term for the NASA administrator. The Space Foundation's pioneering doctrine uh, recommends a term of five years. I am working on legislation that includes a pr provision that establishes a five-year term as well. Regardless of the number, however, it seems that there is growing consensus among stakeholders and advocates to set the length of the administrator's term beyond the standard political cycles. Ms. Chaplin, uh, while you focus mostly on space programs, have you gotten a sense from your time at GO GAO of the differences in how NASA acquisitions differ from those of government agencies uh, that are run by non-political or non-traditional heads? Have you seen a difference in how those acquisition strategies go? Most of the agencies with large acquisitions and complex ones like NASA do have political appointees. Um, we don't get too much insight into the intel world, and that might be something to look at, but they're still political there, too. Um, so I, I don't have a model there to look at. There are other situations, um, agencies that have longer-term tenures for administrators. Um, GAO is actually one of them. We have a 15-year appointment for our Comptroller General, and the purpose is to keep the politics out of our work. Sure. So there are other good models out there. And, and but it, w w from your assessment, uh, and maybe you don't make assessments since you're with GAO, but uh, those kind of models, are, are they better uh, at? We, we don't have one that, that looks at that from an acquisition perspective. OK. There's also other space agencies internationally that have boards and different structures that could be looked at, but we haven't done that ourselves. OK. And Mr. Griffin, uh, when you think about some of the stumbles, uh, obviously your testimony today at the beginning, talking about um, you know 2010 and beyond uh, with NASA and some of the stumbles that we've encountered, uh, if if your term had been extended, and you would have been the administrator, can can you share with us how things might have been different? Uh, well, sir, I don't, I don't know that they would have been because administrators and appointees take orders from the chief executive. I see. If the chief executive really wanted to change the space program, then I would have had the choice of either following orders or resigning. Had I been given the orders that my successor was given, I would have resigned. Um, because I thought that, as I've said now multiple times, I thought that the direction of, of Congress uh, in 2005 and 8 was extraordinarily good. I believed we were on the right path and should maintain it. Uh, therefore, if ordered to, go, to deviate from that path, I, I would not have remained. I, I think, again, the issue, I, I have no objection to considering 
a five-year term, a six-year term, an eight-year term, whatever length of term for the administrator, nor do I have any objection with the way it's done today. I think these kinds of discussions are a symptom of the problem we face, which is a lack of understanding at the top levels of government of the importance of our space program and the need to, to have both a quality program and stability of that program. I'll, I'll use another analogy. If we treated the Air Force as we do the space program, we wouldn't have any flying aircraft. We, 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 would, we cannot decide every few years what we want the purpose of the space program to be. We have to have a societal level agreement as to that purpose uh, and, and then let our uh, appointed officials carry it, it out. And it, it almost doesn't make any difference to me how they are appointed or what their term is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bridenstine. And the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin, is recognized for his question. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> great testimony. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, uh, Dr. Griffin, uh, you testified that the most logical step beyond the ISS is an international partnership led by the United States to return to the moon, this time to stay. Uh, how does returning to the moon and maintaining a permanent re uh, presence there help us eventually send American astronauts to the surface of Mars? Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Babin. I, I love that question. Um, I believe that if God had wanted us to go to Mars, he would have given us a moon to practice on. Um, Colonel Collins made the remark earlier that, I, I'm not trying to quote her, but to the general effect that, that learning how to live on in space and on another planetary surface uh, would transfer directly to learning how to go to Mars, and, and I believe that to be the case. Uh, as and I'll, I'll summarize by saying, as, as an engineer, if you wanted me to say when we're ready to go to Mars, uh, if you will, like the head of naval submarines uh, certifying a submarine for sea trials, then I'll say you're ready to go to Mars when you can put a crew on the International Space Station for six months and they have to live there without any further help from the ground. Then they get ferried to, Mar to the moon and they live on the surface of the moon in one-sixth gravity for 13 months. And then you bring them back and you let them live on the space station again for six more months in zero G. And during all this time, they get no additional help beyond which was that which was pre-planted on the surface of the moon or on the station. So that ends up being a total of about a 26-month cycle um, for that crew. When we can do that and the crew is still alive and healthy, uh, then we're ready to go to Mars and not before. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, Colonel Collins, you testified that program cancellation decisions made by bureaucracies behind closed doors and without input by the people are divisive, damaging, cowardly, and many times more expensive in the long run. I could not agree more. What do you recommend that we do as a nation to prevent these types of cancellation decisions and ensure consistency of purpose over many years and over many political administrations. You hit, we as a country need to discuss these very, very important missions out in the open. They have got to be discussed. I don't believe this was discussed. In fact, I'm sure it wasn't because I was very shocked and very surprised when I learned that the budget was rolled out that first week in February of 2010 and there was a big fat zero in the Constellation program. I asked one of the top managers at NASA, in fact I was up here on the NASA Advisory Council, did you know this was coming? And he said, well we thought we might have lose, we thought we might have lost uh, Aries 1. We had no idea that we were going to lose the whole thing. I was just amazed that does our government work this way? This can't possibly be true. So to be. answer your question, 
what do we do? We have got to ensure that discussion takes place in the open, and, the, and this is the way good businesses need to be run. You, you've got to talk to the people that work all throughout the organization, people outside of the organization, from academia, from industry. It is most certain that everyone will disagree on how we do it, but that's healthy. And then we make a decision by, I mean, you can vote or we can be autocratic about it, but it cannot be a surprise. So however you do that. And I'd like to add one other thing to your previous question about um, going to Mars. It is very, very, very important that the life support systems work. And the space station, this, I know I'm saying the obvious here, but what we're doing on the space station is essential. But the moon and Mars are different places. You've got dust, you do have some gravity, you've got, um, it's just a different place. You have got to test your closed loop life support systems, whether it's in a habitat, a spacecraft, or in a spacesuit. A, a spacesuit is a, like a mini spacecraft. Right. So I just wanted to add that uh, comment to the previous question. Thank you. Okay, thank you so very much, uh, witnesses. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Babbitt, and the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, is recognized for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, witnesses, again, I apologize for being a little bit tardy, but I had a 930 House Foreign Affairs Committee hearing with Secretary of State John Kerry of the State Department budget, followed by Armed Services at 10 a.m. with General Breedlove on U.S. European Command, so I hope you'll uh, bear with me. I got here as quick as I could. I do have a question for each of you, and Dr. Griffin, if you could uh, please lead off. Uh, why do you believe, excuse me, what do you believe the proper role of commercial space could be in the context of a stable, long-term NASA strategic plan? Well, I, I'm, uh, as I pointed out in my testimony, the first commercial cargoes for carriage to the International Space Station were signed under my tenure, so I'm a strong supporter of the utilization of commercial space purveyors uh, in, in our in our strategic plans. Um, that said, I, I think we've uh, maybe a bit drifted off the path. Uh, when I use the term commercial to describe an enterprise, I'm talking about an enterprise such as I've run in the past where you have to raise your own money, develop your own product, uh, bring it to the market, and then you sell it for every dime that you can get. Um, I'm not talking about enterprises where the government has to invest the lion's share of the money in order to earn the right to buy a ticket. Uh, and if the public record is examined, I think that you'll see that in, in uh, recent years in, in our so-called commercial space portfolio, uh, that's what's happened. The lion's share of the money has come from government. Um, in fact, I'm not sure there's a, a share that the lion didn't have. So uh, these types of arrangements I would call private-public partnerships, and I'm not always certain that we're getting the best deal on the public side of those partnerships, and I think we need to look carefully at it. Uh, the second thing that I would observe is uh, if we have, if we were to be so fortunate as to have, again, uh, a national strategic plan for what we want to do in space, uh, it certainly should include uh, as much contribution as commercial space providers can offer. Um, but they need to offer what it is that the government wants to buy. It's not our purpose in government to figure out what our space program should look like so that commercial providers can sell what they want to sell. And again, I would, I would say that the experience of recent years offers some guidelines in that regard. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Colonel Collins or Ms. Chaplin, do you have anything to add? I'll just add that, um, you know, the government is usually the one to push technology and discovery, and in all those areas, that's where the government role should be. When you have lower risk technology or something that's already proven that's needed, that is a good place to use Pathfinder types of commercial efforts where they can prove themselves and even take over some kinds of operations. If you look more broadly beyond NASA, commercial space is starting to play a bigger role in doing things like hosted payloads for government, providing bandwidth for DOD, and um, even running ground operations. There's all good areas for them to be playing in. 
Yes, ma'am. Colonel Collins. Sir, I'd like to just mention the space station um, as far as commercial space. I know this may sound like it's a crazy idea, but okay, the space station we know is funded to 2024, and the U.S. has to decide are we going to fund that out to maybe 2028, or do we stop funding in 2024 and then put it into heavy lift or deep space? I believe that having been in space, I believe that there will be a commercial interest in the space station. I can't really say timing-wise 2024, but there are plenty of tourists and people that have money that would love to go up in space and live on the space station. It is such an amazing, wonderful human experience. People would pay big money to do that. And if we could find a private company that would be willing to take over the space station and sell it like a hotel, sell uh, space up there like a hotel, we may be able to kind of wean ourselves off the space station and get NASA back into deep space. Well, what are just, we paying the thought. Russians now? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 or $70 million per ride? Do you Somewhere. think there's a market for the space station at that ticket price? Well, the Russians have sold one or two, haven't they? If I could make a comment, I don't, I don't think we'll find out if there's a market until we try. Okay. Um, I, I, would, I would echo Colonel Collins' comments about the value, the longer-term value of the space station. Um, I, I have to add, I, I think it's... It's, it's really shocking to be considering that after the multi-decade and multi-tens of billions of dollars investment in the space station, that now we're talking about what date we're going to re-enter it into the Indian Ocean. I cannot think of another example of, of a large laboratory investment or a large facility investment that the day it's completed, we start figuring out when we're going to tear it down. Um, if the government cannot find suitable uses for a laboratory in space, then I would echo Colonel Collins' comment. Maybe we should consider turning it over to a private entity and seeing what they could sell space on the space station for. Thank you for that interesting insight. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Brooks. Uh, in the interest of balance and because he is such a diligent member of this committee, uh, without objection, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Pohlmutter, will be recognized for an additional two minutes. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair, and my friends on the Financial Services Committee wonder where I've gone. I just said I've gone to the Science Committee, so that's uh, what's happening here. Um, Ms. Chaplin, I'd like to ask you, because uh, Dr. Griffin has uh, used the comparisons of the Air Force and the Navy and, you know, building this and building that. <laughs> From a GAO standpoint, I mean, how can we have a multi-year, how does a multi-year kind of acquisition process work when no Congress can bind the next Congress? How do you do that? So typically, you do commit over time to any program. Even NASA does that. The contracts work year by year. Um, the multi-year authority allows you just to go beyond that for a span of time, five years, and commit to buying a lot more items up front. Um, that does tie the hands of Congress, but it doesn't tie funding so much because that's still done on a year-to-year -year basis. So you're just making a longer-term commitment. The issue when taking this authority and applying it to NASA is it, it works better in the production environment. Um, even DOD, before it can employ a multi-year contract, has to demonstrate that there's stable design, stable requirements, that there's going to be substantial savings achieved from buying in bulk. Instead of six airplanes, for example, you're committing to 30. So I, we have some questions in our head about how this could work in the NASA arena. Most, most NASA projects are just one-off satellites, for example, and the cost plus arrangements that they use for that because they involve a lot of discovery are appropriate. Well, see, I guess one of the things we've been talking about is a Mars mission, all right? And I, there's a lot of support for something like that and we pick a date and you know we've had the scientists who say 2033 is when the planets line up in a way that it makes it easier for us to get our astronauts there so that's why I'm taking that date if we give if, if we the Congress say to ourselves and to the president you know we want a date and then we let NASA and its experts kind of say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. These are the building blocks. It includes going back to the moon and at this. I mean, they're the experts on that side. 
Is there, have you seen anything in your experience that gives us a set? We could do a multi-year uh, acquisition or approach where we could dedicate money for the next 17 years. Yeah, usually for long-term projects within DOD, money's dedicated up front. Um, but again, if you're developing and researching a joint strike fighter, all those contracts up until the point that you're ready to produce are sort of in that cost plus range and they go year to year because you have a lot of unknowns and you kind of have to revisit things on a year to year basis. Once you enter the production phase, you're in a better situation to do fixed price contracting that can actually go through many years. Um, so I don't know if, if what we have now would work ideally, the authorities now would work well for the Mars situation. Um, if you committed everything up front, it would be an incredible amount of money that you would have to put aside to, to guarantee that it's all there for the 20-year effort. No, and I thank you for that. I mean, it, it's a big amount, there's no question, but we, you know, at least during my tenure here in the Congress since 2006, we've spent a lot in the Middle East, we spent a lot to keep Wall Street from collapsing, you know, and it's been sort of bipartisan in nature in terms of, of those appropriations. So the country is a wealthy country. It's how we prioritize things. We can do this. There's, from a money standpoint, if we're prepared to make this pri a priority. And that's why I'm prepared to listen, you know, to an approach like uh, Chairman Culberson has of a way that might give both sides of the aisle some comfort going long term, because we this has to be long term. We have to think long term. We can't think just next year. And I would just add, the, the bill talks about multi-year contracting. There are also options for multi-year funding and appropriations that work sometimes on the DOD side. That wasn't mentioned in the bill, but there are some other mechanisms that could be explored on the appropriation side. Okay, thank you, and I thank the chair for giving me this extra time. Right. Thank you, Mr. Pohlmutter. The gentleman from California, Mr. Rohrbacher, is recognized. Thank you very much, and I, I also apologize for being tardy today. I, I was at that meeting with Secretary Kerry, and uh, I, I happen to believe that our space effort is actually as important as American foreign policy to our future, so I try to run between these two. Uh, I've been here 28 years, and of course, uh, uh, Dr. Griffin and I worked together over these years, and I certainly, let me just be on the record that I certainly agree with your concept of making sure we go to Mars, uh, go to the moon before we go onto Mars and learn a lot as we're doing that, getting back to the moon. Uh, what I have seen, Mr. Chairman, is our biggest problem in, in having a space, a rational space program uh, is with us. I mean, uh, we just seem to try to, we prioritize projects and we spend money for projects that we can't do, and thus we, and then we end up defunding what we can do, and uh, that's it's irrational, and I and I understand with all due respect to my my friend and colleague who's so adamant about going to Mars. I have several of my friends who are that way. Uh, we're not ready to go to Mars right now. We don't even know the the technology's not there. But there is the technology and, and availability of doing things that we can actually accomplish right now. And if we want the respect of the American people, we're going to, be, we're going to do it by making sure we get things done. And uh, having a long-term commitment that, that uh, drains money away from the projects that we can do in order to accomplish something that we can't do now and maybe won't be able to do uh, within, a, within our lifetime, uh, that is not being responsible, and frankly, I think that's where, where the problem comes from. We continually uh, uh, try to finance projects that we are incapable of accomplishing at that moment. And of course, you're going to have a, a high failure rate if you do that. So I would hope that as we, uh, uh, and I, as I say, I agree with uh, Dr. Griffith on uh, his approach that we need to step by step several of the things we could do by the way which we could do which may be totally uh, uh, unfunded if we just spend all our money on going to Mars 
is we have a space debris challenge. We're not going to be able to do anything in space unless we have some sort of space debris program. It have to be an international effort. But in the years ahead, it's going to overwhelm us. It's already beginning to overwhelm us. Uh, we don't have a global defense system set up so that if an asteroid, and I'll ask this as the panel, if that, if that uh, meteorite that skimmed the surface over in Russia a couple of years ago, instead of going and being in an uninhabited areas, would have hit a major city anywhere in the world and killed hundreds of thousands of people, do you think that that would have then changed the entire course and direction of our own space budget? Wouldn't that have been uh, a factor that would have overwhelmed us? And then all of these other programs that we financed, like long-term missions to Mars, would just go by the wayside? So we need to take care of that issue, don't we? Don't we need to take care of space debris? Don't we need to take care of those things that we can get done? And in the private sector, we could leave, it, leave things up like, by the, by the way, refueling stations, et cetera. Uh, there is one other lab, by the way, in terms of the space station. I remember, wasn't the space lab also a huge investment that we just allowed to come down as well? That was Skylab, sir. Skylab, and, and excuse Yes, me. we did. We have an unfortunate record of not preserving our capital assets in space. Right. It, uh, it re-entered in 1979. Well, I, uh, again, I would uh, think that uh, the, the problem of not being able to accomplish our missions is can be found right here in the fact that our judgment has been to try to do things we can't do while defunding those things we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byers, recognized for his questions. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all very much for being here. Um, Dr. Griffin, in his prepared statement this morning, Representative Culberson stated, quote, that over the years, a lack of clear mission has worn down morale at many centers. And he talked interestingly about people saying, well, is our mission to go to asteroids or is it to go to the moon again or is it to go to Mars? Um, but I also find the assumption somewhat puzzling when he considered the findings from the annual survey by the Nonpartisan Partnership for Public Service that consistently ranks NASA as the best place to work among federal agencies. And while the median overall index score for large agencies has shown a slight downward trend 2011 through 2015, NASA score actually went up during the same period. Uh, and according to the partnership, the biggest factor employee, affecting employee satisfaction and commitment overall in the best places to work rank is, is related to effective leadership. How do you reconcile NASA being a great, great place to work with Representative Culberson's concern about a lack of morale? I'm sorry, was that for me or for Colonel Collins? Oh, either one, yes. Cur Colonel, Dr. Colonel, Colonel Collins? Well, I think that's a very good question because it depends on who you talk to. I can tell you, though, that when I was at NASA, <coughs> morale was very high. Um, we had space shuttle program. We were building a space station and supporting the space station with the knowledge that the long-term goal is going to Mars. I know that's very far out in the future. I sure hope I'm alive when people walk on the surface of Mars, but I'm, I'm pretty sure my kids are going to be here when we walk on Mars, and I think we're going we're gonna to get there. But to answer your question, um, you know, I think that would, that's not entirely clear to me. I know that when I did surveys like that, I gave NASA the highest ratings possible because I felt that the leadership within the astronaut office and flight crew operations and even at Johnson Space Center was outstanding. And I think that was the perception of my coworkers also. Every uh, organization has its cultural issues. Um, I would have to say of all the places I've worked, NASA is the tops, no doubt. Let me follow up. Represent but, oh, excuse me. Okay, when, when the Constellation program was canceled, what happened shortly after that was people thought, did I just lose my job? What am I gonna do tomorrow? Do I go to work tomorrow? And I think there was, there was a very unstable period there, and I'm not even sure that the bosses knew what to tell their people. Just keep coming to work, just keep doing what you're doing, but when am I gonna lose my job? So, so I think <coughs> that, that's, a, that's really a tough question to answer. I can see both sides of the issue. Let me ask a follow-up. Reverend Culberson also, in her testimony, talked about, I think it was 
um, 27 projects, major projects have been canceled, $20 billion that basically had to be written off, invested, but then lost. If you had a 10-year administrator who emerges from this new board, is it less likely that these projects would have had to be canceled? That remains to be seen. I, I do want to make a comment on the, the proposal for the 10-year uh, administrator. Um, I think that the concept is good. I think it might be too long. In reality, if when you start searching for someone who's willing to commit to 10 years of a very, very difficult job, which is um, your it may be hard to find somebody of all the qualified people out there that want to initially commit for 10 years, and then how do you know that they'd be willing to stay that long? It's just a long period of time. If you went more with five or six, I think your, your uh, pool of qualified uh, potentials out there would be bigger, and you'd have more people willing to take on the very difficult job of NASA administrator. Um, but I think it remains to be seen. Um, on the surface, I would say yes. Okay, just, based on, just based on <clears throat> what I have seen with other government agencies. Let me, one, one last question, Dr. Griffin. Um, you, you, so in the bill proposes a budget proposed by the management board in addition to the one proposed by NASA and OMB and what we work out here on the Hill. Do you have any concerns about a board proposing a detailed budget when they have neither the management responsibilities nor the accountability for delivering results? Well, I do. Um, I do have concerns about that. I, I had to... One of the key things for which I was responsible for when I was administrator was was preparing uh, with all of my staff a detailed budget. And it was something that we paid close attention to because, of course, it had to go from us to the OMB where we would have to defend it to the OMB. And then it would come from the president's budget submission to Congress and we would have to defend it to the Congress. And I didn't want anything in it that I didn't, didn't support and didn't agree with. Um, it would be, I think, very difficult as a practical matter to support that exercise and then to have uh, a, a, a similar but in some ways different budget coming from an independent board. I would, I would wonder where they would get their information. If, if their information came from NASA, as, as it almost must, then really how would it be different than the budget the administrator prepares other than that they have different priorities? But I can ask any group of people what your priorities are, and they're as, you know, likely to be different. So I, I would have concerns about that <coughs> approach. Um, thank, thank but you, equally, I, sir, I, I must conclude by stating that, that anything which can be done to ameliorate and control the influence of the OMB on the process would be welcome. <laughs> I mean, the OMB is, is a haven for largely unelected, unappointed, uh, not very well qualified staff who, who seek to exercise a level of power and control uh, in, in their area that their accomplishments have not earned. Um, You're not doing anything to help OMB morale right now, Dr. Gilman. So. You know, that's really too bad. Um, so, so anything which can be done by the Congress to ensure stable budgeting uh, of appropriate projects I think would be a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure that the board of directors approach is, is, is that method. Thank you. Thanks for your perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, now recognize the uh, gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Griffin, we hear over and over again about a need for constancy of purpose uh, at NASA and the detrimental impacts of shifting priorities, organizational conflicts, mixed signals from Congress, and I could go on and on. How much of this lack of purpose do you think uh, can be changed through a reorganization such as the one outlined in the Space Leadership uh, Preservation Act? Well, sir, as we talked earlier, um, I, I, I think the Space Leadership Preservation Act might be one tool to, to achieve that constancy of purpose, um, but it's, it's just a tool. If, if the Congress at large can uh, can codify into law a space policy for the United States that its citizens support and the space community supports and that we want to do as a society, that is the crucial step. So you're saying we've, we've got to work through the ideological differences and as, as Congress? Uh, yes, yes, sir. And, and I will remind you, if that sounds a hopeless task, uh, I, I was here. Well, if it were up 
to my colleague from Colorado and me, we could work this out fairly quickly. But we, uh, we did this in 2003 and four, following the loss of Columbia, and for a two-year mm -hmm. period, there were I, I myself participated in four hearings uh, in both House and Senate, along with many, many other people, and these things were thrashed out, and we emerged from that period with a good plan. I come from an engineering done. background, and, and, and I believe the space program is fundamentally more engineering than, than, than science. Obviously, there's science, and, and in engineering, I think anyone who's been involved in that field understands that you have to have clearly defined objectives. Otherwise, you'll, you'll never build to design. You'll, uh, and, and you will spend an enormous amount of money and get nothing. And uh, so I, I, I do think we've got to have that, a vision that we can design to, um, which I, I guess, uh, does the lack of continuity at, at NASA affect some programs more intensely than it does others? Uh, I couldn't agree more with your comments, sir. I, I could not agree more. And um, the longer term and larger the project is, the more that lack of, of consistency of purpose affects it. If I have a discovery uh, program, a small, a small satellite mission program to another planet that costs $500 million and, and can be done in three or four or five years, uh, then no, such a program would not be much affected. If we're talking about recreating a new heavy lift launch vehicle, as we are with the space launch system that mm -hmm. Colonel Collins mentioned earlier today, well, that is a multi-year proposition and a multi-multi-billion dollar proposition, and, and it needs to be uh, it needs to be sustained, uh, or, or or not done at all. I've actually visited the facility where that work is being done, and and it needs to be completed because there's not a whole lot of use for it if we don't. And um, uh, I just uh, I think uh, many of my colleagues here uh, would agree with this that we do need to allow NASA to define the vision uh, with, with uh, our oversight, but uh, get behind it. And um, otherwise, uh, we're going to continue to, to waste an enormous amount of money. Dr. Griffin, I'll ask you this question. There was a, an op-ed in Space News. Uh, Mary Lynn Dittmer, the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration touts the flexibility of the space launch system, which um, uh, was just mentioned. Uh, uh, which will be capable of launching a wide array of missions. Given the lack of uh, continuity, uh, how important is it for NASA systems to be adaptable to changing priorities? Well, it would be nice to say that uh, NASA's systems and programs could be easily adapted to changing priorities. Um, I don't think it's very realistic. It's one of those things that everyone would like but is pretty hard to do. When it takes five or six or seven or eight years to accomplish a great thing, uh, if the priorities change in the meantime, you know, you're, you're left hanging. And that's where you run into all of the that, change orders and, and, and the run up in cost, and then everybody's frustrated. Exactly, sir. It costs more money, and you don't get the product out in the end. I thought Mary Lynn's op-ed was very well done. She's far more articulate than I am, and I was, I was, uh, I was glad to see such an op-ed in, in Space News. Well, I had to um, go to another hearing er earlier, but when I, um, while I was here, I heard you talk about um, the overall vision for space and what it means for us, and, and, and uh, Colonel Collins' comment on this as, as well. And that was an inspired, in my opinion, an inspired view of America's role in space. And I, I commend you for it. Uh, my time has expired, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Palmer, uh, now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Hultgren. Thank you, Chairman, uh, and uh, thank you all for being here. But first, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record an article that was co-authored by former Commerce, Justice, Science Subcommittee Chairman Frank Wolf and Norm Augustine, who this committee knows very well. So we ask unanimous consent for uh, submission. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, again, want to thank you all for being here. Uh, so grateful for your work. Especially want to just uh, thank uh, Colonel Collins. Uh, really appreciate your service to our nation and uh, the inspiration you are to young people, uh, but especially to young women of uh, incredible opportunities and how we need them uh, to be involved in uh, space and science and discovery. So thank you, uh, and Dr. Griffin. Uh, so grateful for your service uh, as administrator. Uh, really, I, I think a. a, a 
bright time and, and a time we can be proud of, of your service there. So I want to thank you so much for that. This is an important hearing, and as we continue to look for ways to bring long-term vision and stability for NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, I think it's something we need to be looking at across our entire, entire scientific ecosystem as well. As science becomes an increasingly collaborative and international enterprise, other countries are putting their stake in the ground to find the place where they will lead. America has traditionally led across the board. It is not the only measure, but one need only look at the list of Nobel Prizes per country. Uh, we are the number one, but other countries are catching up very quickly. If we rest on our laurels, we may have a future where we have to send our kids overseas to get the best education in the world where, uh, and to do groundbreaking re research to get that next Nobel Prize. One idea outlined by the article that I entered into the record, uh, by the article written by uh, Congressman Wolf and Mr. Augustine, is uh, for a dedicated fund for scientific research so that we can actually put together five, 10, or 25-year plans. As our witnesses should be able to attest, our researchers and scientists are walking on pins and needles, just hoping that their project can stand pace on budget and outside the ire of OMB bureaucrats or a disinterested administration. When the president leaves or shifts around administrators, researchers have to spend their time catching new people up just to let them know what we are doing. A program can be cut or priorities can be shifted without the full picture. The cancellation of Constellation was a disaster. I think we all can see that now. It has been not just a setback, but it also hurts our standing in the world. I think Russia snickers uh, when we need them to take our astronauts to the space station that our shuttle built. Dr. Griffin, uh, what are the first questions that we get when uh, other nation, from other nations when we come to them with an ambitious long-term project that would require all sides to deliver to see success? What response do we get back from them? Well, in, in my time, uh, we were still working on, we were doing, trying to do two things. We were working on completing the International Space Station because only a third of it was finished when the shuttle went down. And so the first questions I, I faced almost immediately after my confirmation hearing back in, in the spring of 2005 uh, were from our partners, are, are you really going to stick with this? Are you going to see it through? And we, following the loss of Columbia, we knew that we were not going to be able to have as many shuttle flights as we had previously planned. So we had at that time to cut back some on our, what we called our utilization flights in order to prioritize assembly. And I committed, um, I, with, with the backing of, of then President Bush, uh, I, I committed that the United States would finish the station and the size of relief were palpable. So I'm, I'm answering your question by my experience is what they wanna know is are you gonna see it through? Yeah. When we asked them the second thing we were doing per, per our instructions from the White House and Congress uh, well, the second thing we were doing was embarking on a plan for human lunar return. And the written words in the policy said that we would do it in company with our international partners. So it became my job to put that partnership together. The first question they asked is, are you really serious? And at first they didn't really believe it. As several years went by, they did believe it. And by early 2009, they were fully in support of returning to the moon, and then the next year we canceled. Yeah. I had I was of course gone from from uh, uh, Washington by then, um, but I had phone calls from all over the world. Um, I, Eileen made the comment earlier that the NASA Advisory Council did not receive any information prior to the cancellation of Constellation that it would happen. Well, you can take that and square it for our international partners who woke up on a Tuesday morning to find out that the lunar program they thought they were a part of was gone. Um, I, I, I know I'm overstaying my time and yours, but I, I, I must conclude this question with a, a, a story that I think is, is sad for what it conveys. In, tw in the spring of 2010, I happened to be down at Cape Canaveral and, and uh, having dinner at one of my favorite restaurants down there over the years, and a waiter, an immigrant from Italy, who knew me well, came over to my table and said, Dr. Griffin, he said, what, what is this I hear they're canceling the moon program? And I said, yes, that's, that's true. 
And, and in typical Italian fashion, he starts waving his arms and saying, I came to this country because you are the people who can build space shuttles and build space stations and go to the moon. He said, and now you're not? He says, what is it with these people? Do they not know what it means to be a superpower? Mm. And I, I will never forget that conversation. Uh, that is what people from other countries think of us when we start and stop. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I totally agree. My time is up, but uh, really, we need to put our money where our, our mouth is. Uh, we need to follow through on our commitments. And um, so I appreciate it. Again, my time is up. I yield back, Chairman. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Griffith, I know uh, during your, your tenure at NASA, you put a lot of focus on international cooperation. But you were cautious about putting international partners on a critical path, um, especially from the lessons from the International Space Station program. What, recommend, re, I'm sorry, what recommendations would you have for the uh, future administrators regarding international cooperation? Well, sir, the way that I would characterize that, and, and that's a, a superlative question, when we talk about critical path, we have to understand what we mean. Certainly, our international partners in terms of our lunar program were, I'll, I'll use the quote, on the critical path mm -hmm. for a lunar base, uh, because the United States certainly wasn't going to build everything we needed for, for a human outpost on the moon, far from it. Um, when I say that it's a good idea to keep um, partners off the critical path, and that may apply as well internally to the country as externally, a, a given piece of hardware, a, a given mission support function should probably, as best you can, be confined to one entity. So we were going to build the heavy lift rocket. Um, maybe the habitat would be furnished by the European Space Agency. Uh, maybe a laboratory would come from Japan. Something like that. Maybe the power system would come from France, which you know is, as you know, 80% nuclear uh, in domestically. So, my 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 comments about critical path have, I think, in the past often been misinterpreted. When we're doing international programs, we need everybody's contribution. But I, I don't want to build a car by having you know the tires come from one manufacturer and the engine from. I think you get my point. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, growing up during the uh, Apollo time period, um, NASA and those astronauts were an inspiration to me. And uh, that w my life was surrounded by uh, the idea that we were exploring the unknown, that we were uh, doing something that a superpower does, that, that we were taking risks and we were beating the odds of things that that people said that uh, could not be done. There were, there were more reasons that we could not go to the moon than, than there were that we could. But that, I think that helped define American exceptionalism, is that we set our mind to do it, and we did it. And I think that inspiration set us on a path to further greatness. And, and I know it inspired me. It inspired a lot of my uh, schoolmates. What can we do going forward so that our space exploration will have that type of impact on, on the generations that, that are following us. It, it seems, I know that there is a lack of inspiration, I think, in our education system, because a lot of children are, are asking, where are we going? What are we doing? What am I here for? At least during that time period of my life, there was a destiny. We had a purpose. And for Colonel or Dr. Griffin, anyone, is, uh, will we ever see that time again? Well, Thank you for the question. I think that's great. And obviously, the mission we had now, I was inspired by uh, the Gemini astronauts as well yeah. as the Apollo astronauts. I wanted to be one of them as a, as a young child. And it, it led me into the study of math and science and eventually becoming a pilot in the Air mm -hmm. Force. And, and I was uh, Air Force was, as well, so thank you. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it was just seeing what can be done. I wanted to be part of it because it was, to me, it was just a great adventure. And to answer your question, though, we need to teach our teachers, because every astronaut cannot be in every classroom. Right. Now, I learned about the space program from a magazine. Um, there's not enough astronauts to get in all the classrooms. I wish there were, but the teachers need to have continuing education, because I think some of them are a little bit afraid to teach space, because they think the kids might know more than they do, so some of them, they don't, 
they want an astronaut to come in the classroom, but otherwise they don't want to talk about it. So education for the teachers um, so they can get pumped up, and it doesn't have to be done by the U.S. government. A lot of private mm -hmm. uh, entities, educational um, groups around the country teach teachers, and I think we need to do more of that because I, that'll get more young people involved, not just in the space program, but we're becoming you know, so much more technical. We need kids in cyber, we need kids in engineering, energy, There's, it's, it's everything. But you can tie it all to the space program. That's right. I mean, it's, in, as I go back and uh, look at a movie such as The Right Stuff, um, the one that Tom Hanks did, the series, uh, it, it, what it emphasized to me was the ingenuity beyond just the, the engineering, but the thinking outside the box, the development of the lunar landing module, uh, how we broke every other design because we needed to make it lighter. Whoever thought of a pilot standing up? But these are the types of things that, that we just broke the mold and, and decided we're going to do it our way. And that's the type of thing I think that we need to see again, something to inspire this next generation to move forward and take what uh, the hearing we had yesterday was the discovery of magnetic waves. Well, one of the questions was, how is that going to be a practical application? Well, in my sense, the guys who discovered it are not going to be the ones who will take it and make a practical application. But it's the next generation will take that discovery and then match that to something. And I applaud you for what you're doing. I still admire those who have the courage to break the surly bonds of Earth and, uh, and go and explore the great unknown. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loudermilk. And I want to thank the witnesses. This is one of the best hearings I have attended since being a member of Congress, a member of this committee. And I want to thank the members for their, their questions. And the record will remain open for two weeks for, an additional, for additional written comments and written questions from any members who desire to do so. Without any more ado, this hearing is adjourned. Good job, Tom. Good little speech you wrote, too. The Committee on Science, Space, and Technology will come to order. Uh, with that objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. Welcome to today's hearing entitled, The Space Leadership Preservation Act and the Need for Stability at NASA. I'll recognize myself for an opening statement and then the minority, uh, the ranking minority member, uh, Ms. Eddie Bernice Johnson from Texas. And let me say, just looking out on the audience today, I'm glad to see so much interest in this subject. And uh, we have actually two panels today. We're going to start off with uh, Congressman John Culberson, and then we'll go to a panel of three witnesses after that. Presidential transitions often have provided a challenge to NASA programs that require continuity and budget stability but few have been as rocky as the administration change we experienced seven years ago. Even before he was elected president, then-candidate Barack Obama planned to delay the Constellation program being built to take humans to deep space destinations. One of the Obama administration's first acts, <clears throat> in fact, was to cancel this NASA program outright. 
These jarring decisions have been accompanied by repeated budget proposals that continue to cut key programs <coughs> excuse me, designed to take humans to deep space destinations like the Moon and Mars. The most recent proposal released just a few weeks ago would shrink the space launch system in Orion crew vehicle by more than $800 million. Even worse, the entire budget depends on make-believe budget gimmicks. This regrettable approach continues to make a Mars mission all but impossible. It is not the approach of an administration that is serious about maintaining America's leadership in space. The recent report from the National Academies of Science titled, quote, Pathways to Exploration, Rationales and Approaches for a U.S. Program of Human Space Exploration, end quote, stated that the human spaceflight program in the United States had experienced considerable programmatic turbulence with frequent and dramatic changes in program goals and mission plans in response to changes in national policies. The changes had a high cost in program resources and opportunities and imposed what many feared was an intolerable burden on already constrained human exploration budgets. The Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel, an advisory body established by Congress to report to NASA and Congress on safety issues that affect NASA, stated in their recent report in January that NASA faces another challenge that has historically led to disruption and inefficiency and arguably has impact on safety and good systems engineering. This is the challenge of starting over with new programs and directions following administration change. As in prior reports, the ASAP urges constancy of purpose. Failing to stay the course with current programs of record will make it an even longer, costlier, and potentially less safe trip to Mars. These facts are not lost on this committee. The most recent NASA Authorization Act from 2010 contains several provisions that remain the law of the land and continue to guide NASA activities. The Act notes that the commitment to human exploration goals is essential for providing the necessary long-term focus and programmatic consistency and robustness of the United States Civilian Space Program. The Act states that it is in the United States national interest to maintain a government-operated space transportation system for crew and cargo delivery to space. The Act directs that the United States must develop as rapidly as possible replacement vehicles capable of providing both human and cargo launch capability to low Earth orbit and to destinations beyond low Earth orbit. The 2005, 2008, and 2010 NASA Authorization Acts are consistent in their direction to NASA. NASA needs the same certainty from the executive branch that it receives from Congress. Today we are discussing how to provide that stability to NASA once again as we look toward a presidential transition in less than a year. My friend and Texas colleague, Representative John Culberson, has a bill that seeks to do just that. I thank Representative Culberson for his leadership on this issue and I am a co-sponsor of his legislation. We share the goal of providing NASA with long-term consistent support and it is great to have him here today to discuss his bill. One of the first hearings that this committee held during my chairmanship was in fact on this very topic. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses how we can ensure stability in our space program through the next presidential transition. Dr. Michael Griffin provides a unique perspective as the last NASA administrator to serve before a presidential transition. Colonel Eileen Collins not only has served as a pilot and commander of space shuttle missions, but also as a member of the NASA Advisory Council during the last transition. And Ms. Christina Chaplin brings the Government Accountability Office's insightful perspective. We look forward to hearing their testimony and learning how we can ensure that NASA remains on the forefront of space exploration through the next presidential transition. Uh, that concludes my opening statement, and the ranking member um, is recognized for hers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and <coughs> good morning. Uh, I'd like to start by welcoming uh, our witnesses for NASA is a cornerstone of our nation's R&D enterprise, a source of inspiration to our young people, and a worldwide symbol of America's technological proudness and dedication to the peaceful exploration of space. We wanted to succeed. 
Today's hearing is entitled, The Space Leadership Preservation Act and a Need for Stability at NASA. While I have concerns about the legislation itself, I wholeheartedly agree with the premise that we want to preserve America's leadership in space and that NASA will need stability if it is to maintain that leadership role. I am heartened that Chairman Culverson has long felt the same way. That said, I regret that the legislation being discussed today, while obviously well-intentioned, unfortunately is not likely to fix the fundamental causes of instability at NASA. Let me give just a few examples of my concern with what the bill does and doesn't do. First, the bill would establish a board of directors apparently modeled after the National Science Foundation's National Science Board. Of course, NSF and NASA are quite different agencies with quite different missions. So the applicability of the NSF model to NASA is unclear, but there are other differences that also need to be noted. As we know, the members of the NSB are all nominated by the president. The board of directors established in this bill, on the other hand, would have a majority of its members named by Congress using a formula that injects partisan politics into a board that ostensibly is supposed to insulate NASA from politics. In addition, the board would be tasked with preparing a budget for NASA in parallel with NASA's own budget preparations process. This seems to be a prescription for wasteful duplication of the best, at its best with the potential for serious confusion and instability as, as the more likely outcomes. It is unclear to me how this small group of individuals with no agency management responsibilities or accountability is supposed to develop a detailed budget for a $19 billion agency without having to set up, with having to set up an unwieldy competing administrative infrastructure of its own. This is an approach that will not lead to a good outcome. Instead, we should let the dedicated men and women at NASA who are tasked with carrying out NASA's challenging programs be the ones who develop this budget request. It should not be done by a group of individuals who, though may be talented, will not have any accountability for delivering benefits from having an administrator chosen by the president or she, that he or she serves, having a carryover administrator from a previous president's term would do nothing to ensure stability if the president wishes to pursue a different policy agenda from his or her predecessor and doesn't see the administrator as being part of his or her team. In addition, as history shows, having a fixed term for an agency head means little in practice. Only five of the last 15 NSF directors served out a full six-year term. And similarly, in, uh, similar instability has been the norm for FAA, despite the five-year term for its administrators. I could go on, but the reality is that we don't need to set up a new bureaucracy outside of NASA or alter the appointment process for its leaders. If we're interested in ensuring stability at NASA, it is already in our power as Congress to do so. We are the ones who ultimately determine NASA's budget. We can provide the necessary budgetary stability to NASA, or we can destabilize it with appropriation delays, continuing resolutions, and shutdowns. The choice is ours. It's right here in this committee. In addition, we have the ability to set a stable direction for NASA. And we did just that in 2015 NASA reauthorization bill that passed the House. We see that Mars should be the goal of our human exploration program. The president has agreed, though that was determined before he became president. We should take that consensus and build on it, rather than having an unelected board put forth its own exploration vision every four years. The two congressional actions that I have just described, one budgetary and one policy oriented, will do more to maintain space leadership and ensure stability at NASA 
than anything we might do in this bill that we are discussing today. So in closing, I again want to welcome our witnesses. I appreciate your service, and I look forward to your testimony. Mr. Thank Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Our witness on the first panel today is the Honorable John Culberson, Chairman of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, and Science. Culberson, excuse me, Congressman Culberson represents the 7th District of Texas, a district formerly represented by President George H.W. Bush. A longtime space enthusiast, Chairman Culberson is the sponsor of H.R. 2093, the Space Leadership Preservation Act of 2015. We thank him for being here this morning and look forward to hearing about his bill. And the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. John, make sure your mic is on there. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank you, Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Johnson, for hosting this meeting, uh, holding this hearing today, and to, to review the Space Leadership Preservation Act 2015. I also want to uh, thank your staff, uh, particularly Chris Shank and Tom Hammond, for working with me and my staff on this important legislation. Chairman Smith, uh, thank you for supporting this bill as an original co-sponsor. I'm deeply grateful for your uh, for your confidence and support on this important uh, on this important matter. And also want to thank your fellow committee members, uh, Representatives uh, Sensenbrenner, uh, Posey, and Bridenstine for their support as co-sponsors. I especially want to thank uh, my predecessor as the uh, Congressman Frank Wolf, who chaired the Commerce, Justice, Science uh, Committee and helped me uh, develop this legislation originally because Frank saw, as I have, as all of you have, that is, uh, we, we simply have to give NASA greater stability. We need to make this agency less political, more professional, and give them the uh, ability to see uh, uh, in far into the future with the uh, knowledge and with the confidence that, uh, that the Congress uh, will be there behind them. I have uh, uh, some of my very best memories as a, as a boy growing up in Houston of into the space program. I've been a, all my earliest heroes were the Apollo uh, astronauts. I think I, I got my first telescope for Christmas when I was 12. I've had one ever since. Uh, bought myself a rather large telescope as a high school graduation present. Uh, these men and women have been heroes uh, to all Americans. And uh, when I uh, was assigned to the Appropriations Committee, I asked uh, uh, but one thing. I wanted to be to serve on the Commerce Justice Science Committee and one day be there to uh, chair it. And it is, uh, it's an extraordinary privilege for me to work with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Johnson, and all the members of this committee as we do our best arm in arm and uh, to make sure that NASA has the funding, the support that they need to do all that's on their uh, plate. Uh, I have in this uh, in the appropriations bill that the Congress just approved, uh, I made certain that NASA has uh, today the largest appropriation that they have ever received since the agency was created in 1958. Mm. And I will continue to make sure that NASA has the resources they need to accomplish all that is before them. And, and, uh, but that, again, is a year-to-year -year effort. That is, again, a year, something that is, uh, tends to be, uh, uh, to, it, it, it is uh, often too reliant too much on who is in the White House and who holds the chairmanships of these, uh, of these important subcommittees. I also want to be sure to thank uh, my counterpart in the Senate, uh, Senator Richard Shelby, who chairs the Senate uh, Commerce Justice Science Committee. He's an ardent supporter of the space program, and it's been absolutely vital to have him there for his support. You know, although it's been over 44 years since any human has set foot on the surface of another uh, celestial body, when uh, Gene Cernan, my constituent and good friend, and Harrison Schmidt left the moon after three days exploring the uh, Taurus Litro Lunar Valley, a mission control in Houston read a statement from the White House to the Apollo 17 astronauts that said, as the Challenger leaves the surface of the moon, we are conscious not of what we leave behind, but of what lies before us. But today, the glory days of the Apollo program seem to be uh, behind us, and the country seems to have lost focus on exploring uh, what lies uh, before us, or all the wonder that would be, as Tennyson said so well. Uh, the team at NASA, unfortunately, has faced uh, program cancellation after program cancellation. As Mike Griffin points out so correctly in his testimony you'll hear in a moment, Dr. Griffin points out as the year 2009 opened, uh, we had a plan for our nation's space program, a plan of generational scope for what it was that NASA expected to do. But by early uh, 2010, barely a year later, this carefully hewn strategy that had been approved twice by Congress in two successive authorization acts of 2005 and 2008, Dr. Griffin points out, had been abandoned and canceled. 
and I have a, a, a chart here that I've, I'll make sure each one of you have a copy of that Mike Coates, the director at the Johnson Space Center, first pointed out to me that uh, this is the fundamental problem at NASA, that in the last 20 years, NASA has spent more than $20 billion on canceled development programs. No, no, no entity, no company, no entity, no agency of the federal government, no agency of any state government or local government can function in this environment. And think of the heartbreak. Uh, uh, Brian Babin, my good friend and colleague uh, from, uh, from the east side of Houston, represents the Johnson Space Center. Uh, we all know the heartbreak that those great men and women, those brilliant engineers and scientists who have devoted their life to making the dreams of the future come true, to build these incredible machines, these great rockets and spacecraft, they pour their heart and soul into it, yet only to have it yanked out from underneath them. Uh, that is very, very damaging uh, to their morale and destructive to our space program as a whole. This is not a partisan issue. Completely set politics aside. Now uh, forget who's in the White House, what party label. It's, it's just intensely destructive and we cannot uh, continue. It's wasteful, uh, damaging, and it, it, just, it damages our ability as a nation to preserve our leadership in space. And space is the high ground. I cannot imagine General Meade at Gettysburg abandoning Little Round Top, just giving it over. You do not surrender the high ground. And yet I'm very concerned that in the absence of stability, uh, in the absence of uh, giving uh, NASA a greater level of professionalism and making them less political, uh, that the country is going to wind up abandoning the high ground. The, uh, uh, there is no clear mission today, and we simply have to come up with a way to give the agency uh, the ability to give us that vision uh, and with the guidance and support of Congress, make that come true. I had uh, the chance, uh, the honor recently to hear former Navy SEAL Robert O'Neill speak about his work and, and uh, identifying and taking out Osama bin Laden. And one of the things that really struck, stuck with me from Rob's remarks was he said that a lack of a clear mission hurts morale. That's true of all of us as human beings, and it's certainly true of the team uh, at NASA. And that uh, uh, we can help make that, uh, fix that problem with this legislation. I have uh, uh, welcomed suggestions or ideas on how we can uh, modify uh, the legislation, but I put a lot of thought into this. With your help, uh, Chairman Smith and, and uh, Chairman Frank Wolf, uh, we looked at the, uh, some of the models in government that work well. The director of the FBI, for example, has uh, that has, the 10 year term for the director of the FBI is serving very well. They, we know that the FBI is uh, a pillar of integrity, and that director does not think about politics or, uh, or, or who the president is. They focus on enforcing the law and doing the right thing for the right reasons uh, for the country. Uh, these, uh, uh, whether it is the, the president, uh, Ms. Johnson, or whether it's the uh, Congress, your human nature being what we are, there's going to be politics either way. And the idea of the board of directors was to make sure that we had members from both parties recommending uh, appointments to that uh, board who would have to then be submitted uh, by the president to the Senate for confirmation, uh, preserving the uh, separation of powers and the executive's role in making that appointment so there are no constitutional issues and you also have both parties and both houses of uh, Congress having an impact on that uh, board of directors. The, uh, uh, the idea of the uh, budget being submitted directly to Congress is important because if we don't, all of us, none of us know exactly what NASA's best minds uh, have recommended. They submit their budget to the Office of Management and Budget and the budget that we get, Mr. Chairman, and the budget that I receive, the budget recommendation from the President, is not really from NASA, it's from OMB. Uh, as a practical matter, we all know that OMB runs NASA today. The bureaucrats, the bean counters at OMB are the ones making the big decisions for our nation's space program, and it's just unacceptable. I'd like to know, as I know you would, an honest, accurate number, uh, what do the best minds at NASA recommend to the Congress? What's necessary for you to achieve all that's before you? And that's the idea behind the direct budget submission, Ms. Johnson, that we would, as members of Congress, receive a budget submission from the Board of Directors at NASA. They, we would also get OMB's recommendation, but then we can lay them down side by side and see what is necessary to make those dreams of the future come true and, and balance them and figure out what is necessary to, uh, uh, for, the, for American taxpayers to, uh, to fund that recommendation. 
Uh, that longer term for the administrator, I think, is not only necessary for stability to make the agency uh, head less political, but to give uh, that individual the time to make sure that these tremendously complicated and expensive uh, spaceflight programs uh, come to fruition so we don't see this start and stop, as you see on this chart uh, right here. <clears throat> Finally, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I really think that this, uh, con the, from my experience working in, uh, in the Congress, I started out here on this committee and, and when I went to the Appropriations Committee and was able to see, as you have, the, uh, the extraordinary men and women at NASA who, have, uh, who are so dedicated to make sure that the American Space Program is the best on Earth, to, who are so dedicated to make sure that the, the spacecraft and the rockets they build are, are truly the best that have ever been uh, uh, conceived or built by human hands. Uh, I keep coming back to the fundamental problem, the cause of the instability is governance. It's, we could continue to fund NASA, we, we can continue down this path of year-to-year pillar-to-post uh, funding, or we could make fundamental long-term changes that our successors will uh, inherit a agency that is less political, more professional, more stable, more focused on making the dreams of the future come true, more focused on achieving the goals of the decadal survey. Quite frankly, I'd I wish one thing that you could add, I'd love to figure out a way to have a, a human spaceflight decadal survey. The scientists at the National uh, Academy of Sciences do a great job when they prepare the decadal survey for astrophysics, for earth sciences, for heliophysics, for planetary science. And you'll see in my CJS bill, I wired in there that NASA shall follow the recommendations of the decadal survey as they prepare what is necessary for missions in the future. And I made certain they got the money to do it. But what I can't figure out and resolve is how do you have a decadal survey for human spaceflight without having all those conflicts?